Last week, we talked about the dispensation of the promise, and we talked about the promise that God made to Abraham to make him into a great multitude, a great nation. And tonight, we're going to transition into the dispensation of the law. And this law, this might be the first dispensation that takes us two classes to cover, because there's a lot to cover here, and it's so fundamental to, you know, when Pastor Tony says, know what you know what you know, there's a lot in here you need to know, and there's so many things that people get misconstrued and mistaken, so I want to make sure we go slow enough to cover everything. Um, In this dispensation, God... Um, kind of change his course with his chosen people. It starts um, at Mount Sinai when Moses receives the laws, and it goes all the way through until the veil is broken and Jesus ushers in a new dispensation that we'll talk about. There'll be the next class, but this covers almost 1,500 years. The vast majority of scripture, almost all of the Old Testament, falls into this dispensation. So it covers a lot of stuff. Um, We're talking from 1446 B.C. or thereabouts to um, 33 A.D. or so. Almost 1,500 years. And if you look at scripture, scripture refers to this as the Old Covenant as opposed to the New Covenant. If you would, turn to... Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Second Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 14. And you'll see how scripture refers to this. I'm using my NASB tonight. On Tuesdays, I bought a new Bible. And it's a New King James. And it was throwing everybody off last night because I was reading out of the New King James and it didn't match what anyone else had. So I I was keeping people on their toes. But I'm back to the NASB tonight. So 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 14, it says, But their minds were hardened. This is Paul writing. For until this very day at the reading of the old covenant the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in christ but to this day whenever moses is read a veil lies over their heart but whenever a person turns to the lord that veil is t- <laughs> I, I thought angels were coming you was left yeah i was scared to look up But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Scripture refers to it again as that old covenant. Uh, Look at Hebrews chapter 8. It's kind of weird to start a study of the old covenant with New Testament scripture, but it'll make sense. Hebrews chapter... uh, 8 verse 13 is where you're going. It says, When he said a new covenant, he has made the first, i.e. the old covenant, obsolete. But whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. So again, in the New Testament, we see a transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And most people understand the difference. Now, I told you not everybody considers themselves a dispensationalist. And I've been talking about dispensations for several weeks now. But whenever someone says to me, I'm not sure I believe in dispensations, I ask them, do you know the difference between the Old and the New Covenant? And people will say, yes, well, then you're a dispensationalist. Those are two dispensations. So at this very core, this is what it means to be a dispensationalist. You recognize the difference between the old and the new covenant. So this period, again, ends when the veil is torn. Turn to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. 
I'm kind of starting at the ending point. You're going to Matthew 27, verse 51. Matthew 27, 51 says, And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. We see the tail, that's, the, tail the, the, the veil that separated God from mankind is torn by Jesus' work on the cross, right? So that ushers in, again, this new covenant and we just read a verse that says, if you still live under the law, your heart's still on the other side of that veil. But Jesus died to rip that veil, right? This separates these two covenants. And we'll see as we work through this, that this covenant, or this, this dispensation, some of the transitions we see from the last one, is that Israel is no longer just a family. It's transitioned into a nation. So it's, it's gone beyond Abraham's family. It's now a nation. We will see where we ended last in the, in the last dispensation, grace, because God led the people out of Egypt through Moses. That was grace. And then we'll see that this dispensation begins in the wilderness. They're not yet in the promised land because of, uh, of all kinds of this, this journey for an Egypt to the promised land should have taken two weeks. Much, much longer for various reasons. But they received the law in the wilderness. And those are the kind of the distinct characteristics uh, of this period of time. And when you start talking about the law, there are 613, is what most scholars will tell you, laws that fall under this. Now, how they arrive at this number I wouldn't take that number to the bank. And, and here's why, okay? This number comes from uh, the 12th century, a rabbi named Mamanides, who counted them all up, divided them all up, and he says there's 613. There's some that are repetitive. So in that 613, there's some that are stated more than once. So I, I don't, I'm not real rock solid on 613, but there's a bunch of them, all right? Now, he specifically separated them into the dues, and the don'ts. Do these, don't do these. And he had uh, 248 do's and 365 don'ts. And it added up to 613 total laws. And it's important to understand how these laws are categorized because it's key to understanding this dispensation. It's not just a bunch of laws that are forever true for all people at all times. There are three main categories of laws. And I want you to understand the difference. You've got moral laws, ceremonial laws, which mainly deal with ceremony, cleanliness, um, setting the Israelite people apart from everyone else. And then you have judicial and civil laws so the moral laws are those laws like the Ten Commandments the Ten Commandments are moral laws they're grounded in God's morality God's righteousness the ceremonial laws like I said they have to do with sacrifice they have to do with worship cleanliness religious duties it's when the tabernacle was erected and constructed that had to do with ceremonial laws and then judicial and civil laws were the laws of the nation. They were the laws of the government. They regulated the administration of justice. So it's, it's much like our judicial system today, which, no matter what people will tell you, was based on the judicial system of the Israelite people. That's where we came up with it. It wasn't our idea. We took what worked for the nation of Israel and we customized it to the United States. 
we have a judicial system. They had a judicial system. It covered their criminal law, their civil laws. So of these three categories, which do you think still apply to you today? Moral. Moral. Why? Because it's the Ten Commandments. Because it's the Ten Commandments. You're right. But the moral commandments, the moral laws, are grounded and based in God's holiness and his character and his righteousness. And one of the chief characteristics of God is that he never changes. If it was moral then, it's moral now. If it was immoral then, it's immoral now. Right? If it's a judicial or civil law, I just told you that was the laws of the nation, none of us live in Israel. Their laws don't pertain to us. If you move to Israel, whatever laws that still remain will apply to you. But as long as you live in Ohio, you worry about our laws, right? The ceremonial laws, again, were given to one particular people in one particular place at one particular time, none of which are us. It was the Israelites. The moral laws... The Ten Commandments still apply, all right? Um, this is important to understand because people get this screwed up all the time and it will completely throw off your interpretation of Scripture. In fact, one of the biggest gotchas that non-Christians will use, they'll say it's something like this. Kenny, you call yourself a Christian? but you think homosexuality is a sin, but yet you'll go to Red Lobster and eat shellfish. What? Well, the laws of Moses said don't eat shellfish. You're a hypocrite. Is Kenny a hypocrite? Yeah. No, he's not a hypocrite because dietary laws fall under ceremony. They don't apply to Kenny. Laws concerning sexuality are moral. And it's not just the Ten Commandments. There's other morality laws built into this law. And I want to show you some examples because the way you interpret the law comes down to determining which category does this law fall under. It's key to understanding what applies to you and what doesn't. And if you get it wrong, you'll, you'll be completely screwed up. All right? Turn, if you would, to uh, Exodus chapter let me find, I'm sorry, Leviticus chapter 11. And I'll show you what I mean. The only way to figure this out is reading the, script, the scripture thoughtfully and in context. You can't take a verse on an island and then think it applies to everybody for all time. Leviticus uh, chapter 11, starting at verse 9. This is part of the law dispensation that we're talking about. Leviticus 11, it's right after Exodus, it says the very beginning of your Bible. Leviticus 11, starting in verse 9. These you may eat. Whatever is in the water, all that have fins and scales, those in the water, in the seas, or in the rivers, you may eat. But whatever is in the seas and in the rivers that does not have fins and scales among all the teeming life of the water and among all the living creatures that are in the water, they are detestable things to you. And they shall be abhorrent to you. You may not eat of their flesh and their carcasses you shall detest. Shellfish falls into that latter category. That's why everybody thinks that's a gotcha. If you eat something from the ocean that doesn't have fins, in scales, they say you're sinning. Well, no. Okay, you have to look at the context of what we're talking about. This entire chapter, when we're talking about um, what we eat and what we don't eat, has to do with cleanliness. If you look through this chapter, you'll see the word unclean over and over and over again. 
because he's talking about what makes you clean ceremonially and what makes you unclean. These animals, way back in chapter 11, verse 1, he says, The Lord spoke again to Moses and to Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the sons of Israel, to the Israelites, saying, These are the creatures which you may eat from all the animals are on the earth. Some will make you clean, some will make you unclean, and it's important to know the difference because of ceremony. It applied to the Israelite people in a specific time frame. Now turn to Leviticus chapter 18. You're going to verse 22, 18, 22. You shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female. It is an abomination. A little more to the point, right? Now, if you remember, in chapter 11, when he's saying what you can eat and what you can't eat, he said it's abhorrent to you, sons of Israel. It's unclean for you. In this verse, he just says it's an abomination. To who? God. We're talking morality in this verse. This is a moral law versus a ceremonial law. Moral laws never change. If it was an abomination then, it's an abomination now. It doesn't matter what Facebook tells you about Pride Month. It's an abomination. God's Word. I'm not trying to upset anybody, but that's how you interpret Scripture. There's some other big clues, too. When you look at, I said context is important. If you look in the book of Acts... Dietary laws. Does anyone remember the vision Peter had? Eat whatever you want. It's explicitly um, canceled out in the New Testament. The moral law that I just read is doubled down on. Go to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter six, verse nine. For do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals. It's still a sin in First Corinthians because this law is based on. God's righteousness, God's holiness, God's morality. It never changes. It will never change. It will always be a sin no matter what mankind says. It's not grounded on us. It's not grounded on Clark's opinion. It's grounded on God's righteousness, which is unchanging. There's a difference. And I've heard so many Christians say, Christians... Okay, I'm not talking about unbelievers. I've heard Christians say this law doesn't apply anymore because it was part of the Old Testament law. It absolutely still applies. You have to know what you know what you know. And as you read through the law, that's 95% of the battle is figuring out is this law, this, you know, of 613, does it apply to me or not? Most of them won't. The vast majority of them will not. But there are some grounded in the morality of God that do, and they will always apply to us. So that's part of understanding Scripture and part of interpreting Scripture. And that's why when you take a verse on the island and you read something about fish, and then you try to apply it to all people at all times, really all you're saying is, I have not a clue what I'm talking about. Sorry? Did I hear something? 
Oh, okay. So, you got to know what you know what you know, right? That's how you understand the law. So, it's important to get. It's important to understand. Um, let's go back to Exodus chapter 19. Because I want to read the very beginning of this. Exodus 19. Verse 3 through 8. This section tells us the story of Moses receiving the law on Sinai. Exodus 19, starting in verse 3. It says, Moses went up to God. And the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people, and he set before them all these words which the Lord had commanded them. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. So God delivers the law to Moses on Sinai, and there's a fundamental difference between this law and the dispensation of the promise that we read or we, we studied last week. God told Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. Remember I told you he had commanded it, he had commanded it, we failed to do it, we didn't expand the kingdom, we, didn't, um, we, we weren't fruitful in, in, in multiplying the way that he intended. So finally God said, okay, I'm going to do this. It depends on me. It's going to happen. There's nothing you can do that will stop it. This is said a little differently. It says, If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among the all, all the people. If. That's a big word in this passage. If. If you do this, I'll do that. This is a conditional promise versus, to, versus an unconditional promise that we saw last week. The Abrahamic covenant is unconditional. There's nothing that can be done that will stop it. This is conditional. If you do what I tell you, I will make this happen. That's a conditional promise. It's like when you go into Walmart and you tell your kids, if you stay behaved, I will buy you a candy bar. And then they act like fools. It's, I'm in my house. No, I mean, it, it, that's a conditional thing, right? If you do this, I'll do that. This was conditional upon their response. And what did they agree to? All the people said, all you have spoken, we will do, right? We will do. Now, most scholars will tell you that understanding the first um, five books of the Bible, what we call the Pentateuch, that, that's the key core passage. That's the thesis statement of the Pentateuch. If you do what I commanded, I will do this. That's the key to understanding the whole thing, right? God gives this law specifically to the house of Jacob. It's important to understand that it was intended for them and he passes this, uh, this law down. And what you see is a connection between the Abrahamic covenant and the law. The Abrahamic covenant, he promised, he said, I will do this. This law 
is the vehicle by which he intends to do it. I'm going to set you apart. I'm going to make you my own. All you have to do is everything I've told you to do. Keep my laws. And this will come to pass. You will be my people. You will be blessed if you do this. Right? So what it tells us is they will become God's special treasure, his own possession, his royal property. This means they're going to enjoy a unique relationship with God compared to all the other nations. He says you will be a kingdom of priests. We talked about this when we talked about the covenants. He says you'll be a nation of priests. And what that means is you will teach all the other people of the world how to live in relationship with God. How, if you want to know how a nation is supposed to relate to God, all they'll have to do is look at Israel because they're a nation of priests and they will be a holy nation, which means they're set apart and completely different than everybody else. They're set apart for God's purposes. Okay, So they have an opportunity to become a testimony to the whole world about what it is to live under the government of God. That's the whole purpose of this. That's what this means. You have an opportunity to show the whole world what it's like. How did they do? They rode the roller coaster. They did well for a little bit, and then they failed. And then they did well for a little bit, and then they failed. It's hard to talk about Israel without doing the roller coaster. They should turn that into a dance. <laughs> right? Sometimes they're obedient. Sometimes they're not. So what we find is partial obedience. So what we see throughout their history is partial blessings. They're not fully obedient. They're not fully bought into this. And it's, it's borne out throughout their entire history. So they're blessed at times. They're not blessed at times. Because God said, if you do this, I'll do that. But they didn't always do what they were supposed to do, right? So we see partial blessings. And what is... I, I, I always tell you that in these dispensations, there's a, a responsibility on mankind. What's their responsibility? What was that? Follow the laws. Follow the laws. Which ones? The Ten Commandments. Just the Ten Commandments? Yeah, they got a whole list. Yeah. All 613. <laughs> That's their responsibility. Because look at what they said. God said, if you do this, I'll bless you. And the people said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. They were in. We're going to do it. And then it was hard. They find out it's hard to do, but what they had agreed to do was follow 613, or about, laws, right? All the do's and all the don'ts. The moral, the ceremonial, the judicial, we're going to do it all. That's their responsibility. Lisa? You said something there that caught my attention. Though. They agreed to do all that God said. God said the Ten Commandments. They said the other 600. Sure. There's, there's a, well, actually, if you go to the man-made laws, there's way more than 600. Yeah. These 600 are all part of the Levitical law. They're valid. Mm -hmm. If you add the man-made stuff that they made up on their own, I don't know the count. Maybe you do off the top of your head. We're talking thousands. Yeah. That, I, I don't know off the top of my head. But all this stuff is valid. <laughs> These are the do's and the don'ts. It's in the code. By the time we get to Jesus in the New Testament, what we've seen is they've added thousands more. So they've taken, they couldn't do these. So to make it harder on themselves, they come up with a thousand more. We just get these right. I mean, let's just get the Ten Commandments right. They can't even do that. So what they had agreed to do was to follow everything. That's their responsibility. Do you remember a couple of dispensations ago, there was only one law? Don't kill anyone. One law. We couldn't do it. We failed. Now there's 613. We're certainly not going to do it, right? I told you there's a whole dispensation of consciousness that tells us that if you're left up to your own conscience, you're going to screw up. If you leave me alone unattended long enough, I'm going to do something stupid. It's probably going to involve pizza. <laughs> I'm going to do something stupid if you don't keep an eye on me, right? 
Could happen. It could ha and pizza. I could cut off my finger while eating pizza. Stuff happens. So they failed in this, right? Um, let me ask you this question. And this is kind of a, a key to understanding this dispensation. If they couldn't hold up to one law, thou shalt not kill. And then God gives them 613. And they don't have a chance of doing this. What's the purpose of this dispensation? Prove that we need Jesus. Say that really loud. To prove that we need Jesus. It proves that we really need Jesus. You can't hold the law, right? Now, this is why this is key, because again, I hear Christians say this. When they, when they, they ask the question, or they hear the question, how were people saved in the Old Testament? And what Christians will say was, well, in the Old Testament, they were saved by the law. In the New Testament, they're saved by Jesus. The law was never intended to save anyone. That's not its purpose. We'll read some scripture to show you that, but that's not the purpose of the law. The proper answer to that question, if you read the book of Hebrews, they were saved by faith, just like you. They were saved the exact same way. And remember, I told you that the, the revelation of scripture is a progressive revelation. We have the completed revelation, right? Literally, we can read through the book of Revelation. They didn't have that here. They have part of the Revelation. They've got the laws. Um, but we talked about Adam and Eve, right? When God said, your offspring's going to crush the head of the serpent, that's a revelation concerning Jesus Christ. It's a partial revelation, but it's all they had. And they had to put their faith in that revelation to be saved. They're saved in the Old Testament exactly how we're saved now. It's all about Jesus. It's all about faith. Hebrews chapter 11, Hall of Faith. Read it. It will, it will back up what I'm telling you, okay? But I want to show you some things here about the purpose of this dispensation. Turn to Romans chapter 3. Going to Romans 3, um, verse 20. Because by the works of the law, No flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. It's through the law that we realize we can't maintain the law. You're exactly right. It's through the law that we realize we're sinners. The truth is, I'm not going to maintain 613 laws perfectly. I'm not going to maintain 10 of them perfectly. Especially when you look at Jesus in the New Testament. He ups the antes on all those, those Ten Commandments, right? Thou shalt not kill. That one's pretty easy. I've never killed anyone. It's the man I've, ha I've hated some people. <laughs> Fail. Jesus says if you've hated them, you've killed them. It's the same emotion, right? Um, thou shalt not commit adultery. Pretty easy one. Unless you thought about it. Unless you thought about it. Now you're in trouble. Jesus makes it harder. So we can't do 10. We have no chance of doing 613. I, I can't even list all 613. I don't even want to try. But the purpose is to reveal the fact that I'm a sinner, right? Romans 3.20 says it's through the law becomes the knowledge of sin. And with the knowledge of sin, I start to realize I need a Savior. I use this metaphor all the time, and I think... I always credit it to Charles Stanley. I'm only about 65% sure this was his story, so if I'm wrong, I apologize. But he said that when he was in high school, he was a lifeguard. 
And the worst kind of person to try to rescue who was drowning, he said, was a big, muscular, strong man because they're tough and they didn't want to admit that they were drowning. He said, so if you weren't careful, you'd swim out into the middle of the lake and you'd try to save this guy and he would take you down with him because he's big and he's strong and he don't need no help, right? So he said the best way to save a person like that was to swim out about five feet away and wait until they were darn near passed out. Then you pull them out of the water. So you had to wait till they were almost dead to save them. If not, you were going to die with them. It's the same with sin. If I don't understand I'm a sinner, I don't recognize my need for a savior. Well, it's through this law that this knowledge of my sin piques my, my conscience, right? And I realize I need help. I can't do this on my own. I need a lifeguard. The worst The worst person to try to invite to church is the guy that thinks I'm too good for it. I'm I'm good just the way I am. I don't need it. That's where I was for the first 30 years of my life. I'm a pretty good guy. I pay my taxes. I don't drink. I don't cuss. I don't smoke. I'm good. No. There's 613 laws. I was all kinds of a sinner, right? I just didn't recognize it. That's the point of this dispensation. Turn to um, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 1. For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have been conscience, would no longer have had consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. It's impossible. The law was never intended to take away anyone's sin and to save them. That's not its point. Its point, you're absolutely 100% right, is to tell us we need Jesus, we need a Savior. The whole point of this dispensation is to move us closer and to prepare the world for a Savior. This is all about God's plan for redemption, his redemptive purposes. And what Israel wound up doing, are they God's chosen people? Absolutely. What were they chosen for? To show the rest of the world that you can't get to heaven on your own. They were shown or used to demonstrate to us that you need a Savior. That's why God chose them. Not because they were so much better or smarter than anyone else. They were sinners just like we are. But God chose them to demonstrate the need for a Savior. It's unfortunate that I hit a weird button. It's unfortunate they missed the whole point. All right? So they failed in a couple of different ways. And I told you that every dispensation, there is failure. They failed to follow the law. That's the first way they failed. There is another big failure that is marked by this dispensation. I told you it ends when Jesus sacrifices himself on the cross and the veil is torn, right? The second failure in this dispensation is they failed to recognize their Savior when he came. That's the big failure. Um, Turn to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. 
We're going to John 19, starting in verse 12. Most of you have probably read this passage before, but this marks the big failure of this dispensation. As a result of this, Pilate made efforts to release him, Jesus. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. Therefore, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the pavement, or on, on the judgment seat, at a place called the pavement. But in Hebrew, Gabbatha, now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. So they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he then handed him over to be crucified. That's the big failure of this dispensation. Their savior was there. They had centuries to recognize they couldn't uphold the law on their own. Their Savior shows up in their midst, and they fail to recognize him, and they miss the opportunity when he's right in front of them. Too often, we miss the same opportunity today because we can't recognize our need for a Savior. That's the big failure in this dispensation. Every dispensation is followed by judgment. There's all kinds of judgments throughout this dispensation. They were taken into captivity by Assyria, by Babylon, by uh, the Persians. They're, they're scattered, right? They're dispersed. Jerusalem was ransacked. The temple was destroyed. That's all part of God's judgment because of their failure to do what they were supposed to do. So I always end on this question. What does this dispensation teach us about God? What do you learn about God from the law? Nothing. How about this? Sure. Requires 100% holiness. I was going to say it this way. I like that better. I was going to say his standard is perfection. Right? 100% holiness. Is there anyone here that meets that standard? I sure don't. No one that I've ever met does. I've met a couple of people who thought they did. Literally. I, I'm not even joking. I've met Christians that told me, I'm good. I've attained 100% holiness. I wish I was joking. For all, I'm sorry? Quite a few. Quite a few. I couldn't be in their presence. I'd probably get slow. Well, they're liars because they have to themselves to see. I'm sorry? They're liars because they're practicing self-deceit. Amen. Yeah. Absolutely. So All men fall short of the glory of God, right? Yes. No one is perfect. We're all in need of a Savior. And the day you wake up and you're perfect, Christ's sacrifice meant nothing. You cannot do it on your own. Scripture attests to that. I've met people that believe it. God's standard is 100%. Second thing I would say we learn is that the entirety of Scripture, the entire context of Scripture, is once again, I've said this before, it's about Jesus Christ. Amen. I told you this, this dispensation covers the vast majority of the Old Testament. And every bit of it is to prove to the world you need a Savior. All of the Old Testament. There's churches, I wish I was making this up, that don't teach the Old Testament. We only need the New Testament. We're Christians. Well, you're missing hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years that all point to Jesus. Why wouldn't you talk about it? We can learn from it. Now, I'm not a Jew. I'm not an Israelite. And I told you some of this stuff doesn't apply to me. But these moral laws sure do. And I can learn a lot about the moral laws from the Old Testament and from this dispensation.
It's all relevant to my life today. If you read it correctly. All right. Are there any questions? Yeah. What are the religions that only believe in the Old Testament? The religions that only believe in the Old Testament were predominantly would be Orthodox Judaism. And the Greek Orthodox. Well, no, Greek Orthodox is Protestant. But they chop up some of the New Testament. My nephew is Greek Orthodox. Well, Greek Orthodox is Jew. Okay, you're right. You're absolutely right. There's Greek Orthodox Jew, and then there's a Greek Protestant church as well. So you're right. But Judaism, Old Testament. Any other questions? Comments? Snide remarks? For the second week in a row, I'm wearing a shirt that someone here bought me. This one says, I'm sticking with Jesus. I really like it. My goal is to never buy a t-shirt again. <laughs> Dave, would you close us out in prayer?